I'm Will. And I'm Steven. And this is the Post P Chronicles. So, Steven, what do we have going on today? We got a very special guest, long awaited, the one and only Peter Meyerhoff. What's up, Peter? How are you today? What's, what's up, guys? How are you guys? Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're doing pretty good, man. Definitely, we appreciate you coming through. Roll call with Chappie. Most definitely, we appreciate you, bro. So, first and foremost, tell us your story. Where'd you grow All up, right. man? Yeah, so I'm from Arizona. Um, grew up like a little suburb area out here, and I'll give you guys a little crash course of how I grew up. You know, I uh, so I had I had it all as a kid. I was in a movie. Um, I had a modeling agent at like 13. I was a top athlete. You know, I was the most popular kid in school. I had it. I mean, I had it all. Like life was easy for me as a kid, and um, my life kind of spiraled upside down freshman year of high school. Time out! Time out! Time out! You were in a movie? Hold up. What's going on? Was it E.T.? What's going on? What movie was this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, dude, it was, a, it was an old Japanese documentary about the baseball pitcher. Do you remember Hideo Nomo that played yeah. for the Dodgers? Yeah. That had the w- crazy windup. So, it was about him actually coming over to play baseball in America. And I, it was crazy. I never actually got the copy of the movie because it was filmed by some da- uh, Japanese film company. But I was in a movie. And I was actually hit. I actually got to hit off Hideo Nomo when I was like 13 years old. Wow. And so, you were a good yeah. athlete. What sport did you play? Baseball, football, boxing, and the boxing, thank God, is what helped me when I ended up going to prison at 18 years old. So, uh, But yeah, I did it all. I ran track. I just It's all I did. I never played video games in my life. It's all I was doing. I was out in the, in the streets playing sports or something. So safe to say you had a pretty healthy and good upbringing? And then, um, it, dude, like I said, I, I would, didn't have one complaint in the world until uh, freshman year of high school. And um, Hold on one yeah. second. Uh, we didn't. We wasn't able to hear you. The sound was messed up. So you said the first. Uh, you had no concern in the world to the freshman year of high school. What happened freshman year? I was, um, you know, so my mom was a flight attendant, so she was out of town four or five nights a week, and my parents had split up when I was like ten. So of course I lived with my mom, and I had pretty much free reign in that place. Just took advantage of the whole situation, and I, I actually dude, took one for the team. So me and it was my old best friend, and it's coming full circle. You'll hear the story, but this. His house is actually the one that I went to prison for robbing. Wow. And he, but dude, we were best friends, the two most popular kids. And he asked me to take one for the team. He wanted to hook up with this um, chick, Lindsay. And he asked me to take one for the team and hook up with her friend, Ashley, who was already not a virgin. I'm still a virgin at this time. And I'm like, whatever. I, and here's the deal. I, I've known the chick since we were in first grade. Like, my whole life I grew up with. I could have had her anytime I wanted her. Never wanted her. Took one for the team. So we have, and we're like kids. We're not even driving. So they s- sneak out of their uh, bedroom. Her older brother drops them off and literally supplied us with a, we had a big bottle of Jack Daniels. And he came and snuck them out of the window, dropped them off at my mom's house. So me and Ashley hook up. My buddy and Lindsay hook up. We both lose our virginities that night. Saturday night, do the exact same thing. No joke. Like, he sneaks them out. We drink the second half of this bottle of Jack Daniels, do the exact same thing again. We both have sex with the girls. Same whatever. Sunday comes around, and I'm not joking. I go to call them just to hang out. And it was like, it was so weird. Like, they were acting like like they were like kind of like quiet on the phone to me, and then like Lindsay says something. She's like, "I'm mad at you," and I was just like, "I don't. Uh, what could you possibly be mad at me for?" And she won't tell me. And I was like, "It was like super weird." And it was, I was like, "Whatever. I'm not talking to them anymore." So I go home, and by the time I go home, my mom is on the phone with with, and she's literally the next thing I hear my mom saying is that your son raped my daughter. What? And I was like what the hell did she just say? My mom hangs up the phone and tells us, I was like, you are kidding me. So I ended up having to talk to the police. To this day, I don't know. I The only thing that would have made sense is I seriously think that she got caught sneaking into her bedroom window and it was the only thing that she could come up with that was like quick to try and take some blame off her. I think it was, to be honest, I think, and I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt, I think it was just like a stupid spur of the moment decision that she didn't realize like how big of a lie it was and how bad it was until like afterwards. And she didn't want to make herself look like a liar. So, of course, she didn't want to press charges. Um, but, of course, went to school telling everybody about it, bragging about it. And I had to go from, like, being the most popular kid in school to, like, I had to drop out of school the next day. Like, they had – because I was, I was a freshman kid, and they had, like, the police officer there and the principal, like, were getting messages from – uh, from students there that like you know it wasn't safe to be at school and, like some bad was gonna happen to me so they like locked the school down come grab me like no joke give me a police escort off campus and pretty much kind of pretty much kind of tell me like yo it's not safe for you here like just leave and we, we have to figure out what's gonna what's gonna happen here. so i end up going out of there and I drop out of school and then i stop hanging out with all my athlete friends that play sports and i right. start hanging out with dudes that do drugs and dudes that aren't in school and right. i got 
I experimented with crystal meth, smoking crack, did ecstasy all for the first time the same weekend. And this was just a regular weekend for these guys. Mm. And that's what my life took over for the next few years. And then spring break, which should have been in my senior year in high school, we're at my mom's house now. You know, and by this time I've been I've been stealing cars, doing a bunch of bad stuff, you know, like getting into meth for a few years. So you can imagine how bad your life goes. Yes. Right. And my brother and his friends come back and tell me that they had just um, burglarized the Nelson's house. And this is the kid, Brandon Nelson. And he was one of the richest, most spoiled, rotten kids in all of Ahwatukee. And we're like, no way, where are they? And they're like, they're in Hawaii for a week. And the, literally their back door was open. So we go back. And I'm not joking. I don't even make it out of the garage. I take change, some DVDs, a drill, a snowboard, some Jordan basketball shorts and Jordan sandals. And by the time I'm in the garage, my, my friends come in and they tell me that they took all the jewelry. We all run out of the house. And these dudes, we get back to the house and my buddy pulls out a, just a bag of jewelry wow. and i was like oh my god and we're, dude i wasn't no big time thief like it was right. so much for like, the second i see all this shit i was like i don't even know where to, where to off this shit to you right. know what i'm saying like <laughs> I, I sell little shit for drugs you know what i'm saying like i'm not no big kingpin none of that shit like so it instantly went from like we pulled a big lick to, i was like but i don't even know how to sell this shit now like the last thing in the world i, I have a hookup for is to sell thousands of dollars in diamonds you know and um i end up getting 12 years in prison for that burglary crime mm. there's 10 kids involved um my co-defendant of course had told the cops that he was sleeping in my house told them that i had stolen the jewelry told him that i came back and woke him up and told him i did it and told the cops where the jewelry was i of course thought i'm like this hardened criminal i was like i ain't saying shit and they're like uh, well, all right we're gonna make an exam out of you and I, there was 10 kids involved i got 12 years in prison my other co-defendant got two and a half years and he got caught selling jewelry to pawn shops so wow. he had three other class three felonies and he got two and a half years. Everybody else got jail time and probation. And wow. I served like 11 years and 10 months straight on. I went away at 18. I got out a month after I turned 30 years old. So you were the fall guy. You know, there you go. It's kind of crazy that one little lie from a teenage girl can change the entire trajectory of your life. And me and Will were just talking before we got on the air how there's two sides to every story. And a lot of times nowadays we're guilty until proven innocent. You were just guilty right off the bat. Never got to prove your innocence. And it led to pretty much ruined your whole life. That one little lie from an accusation, an accusation that didn't even the rise cops, to a. Yeah, <laughs> she refused to take a lie detector test too, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll take a lie detector test right now." Like, well, she doesn't want to take, and I was like, "Then how is this going on?" You know what I mean? But yeah. then, dude, it's just like, yeah, you're right. You're you're guilty. You got to prove your innocence, man. I was not able to do that, and I was like, so I was I was just a mean, angry little kid after that, bro. You know what I mean? I did not want to live. I had started hanging out with dudes that just do bad shit, and you're just whole. Life spot was out of control. And I felt like it was just like, like flashing and bam, I'm like doing 12 years of prison. I was like, what the fuck happened to my life? You know what I mean? Right. So you're 18. All of a sudden, this reality that I'm going to prison the next 12 years hits, you know, you may think you're a man, but you're not a man yet. I'm sure you got to grow up real quick. What's going through your mind and what's those first couple months, weeks, years in prison look like for you? Dude, what's going through my mind is like, uh, all, I remember all I could think of back then was like how, and this is how like young my mindset was. It's like I'm, I remember like trying to compare it to how long it took me to turn 18 years old, and it felt like it took an eternity. And I was like, mm. I have to do two thirds of that just to get out of prison if I don't catch any time and do all that stuff, you know. So like the 12 years, as I'm sure you can attest, this doing 16 or whatever, like dude, it feels like a life sentence. You know, the last yeah. thing in your mind is ever like the last thing in your mind is ever when you're getting out. No, you know what I mean? Like day at a time. Yeah, and by the time I got out, I was, like, I was like, holy shit, I'm actually going home. Like, I didn't even <laughs> ever think I was going home, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and I remember walking that first chow hall at night, and I remember, like, nobody even, like, noticed me, and I was just, you feel like an absolute nobody. I'm, like, thinking, how the hell am I going to go through doing this 12 years like a nobody, you know? Like, no one even cares if I'm here. Like, I could be gone the next day, and no one even noticed me, you know? And I was just like, dude, how is this happening to me? And um, I was just really angry, and then luckily, I, ended up, I used to box, so... I ended up beating up a couple dudes there, and uh -oh. one of the dudes was the dude that was running my building, and he was just trying to bully me, you know. And I heard about hard check stuff, and I could—I'm a real good at sensing vibes and stuff, and I could tell that like no one there really respected me, and they thought I was like this little pretty boy punk ass kid, you know. I had—I was 150 pounds with long blonde hair, and <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was not this image back then. Dude. I hit puberty about halfway through my sentence, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, he tried—he just tried like punking me, bro, and I was just like, I said some smart ass shit to him, dude, and then whooping the shit out of this dude and he was like legit twice my size you know and uh 
And you know what's crazy? He was one of the dudes I turned into at the end of my sentence. You know, like he'd be up there oh. doing working out, doing back rooms at five a.m. in the bathroom morning. No one just didn't like little young punk ass kids, and that's exactly what I was at the end of my sentence. And yeah. The only difference is I was I was a little tougher, and he probably wasn't a little punk ass kid though. So I ended up whooping his ass, and then the next day I come out there and they're like, kind of tell me like, "Yo, you whooped the dude who's running this building." So do you want this building? And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like, what is, what, is, what do you mean to walk the building? You know? So they had to like break it down to me, you know, and they're like, "All right, do you want to like start putting in work?" And I'm like, "What does that mean, putting in work?" You know? And they're like, "Tell me, like, both we get a snitch." I was like, "Oh yeah, sign me up for all that shit." All the activities. Yeah, all that stuff, and I just started just like politicking, man, and just whooping dudes, and all. That. And then so that from then, like, the only thing that I wanted, I remember like when these OGs, you know, when you when you first walk around and you see some of the OGs, and you know, you're like, "Damn, these fools are like," you look at them like they're legends, you know. Yeah. Like all I wanted to do when I was a kid was like. All I cared about now was just like making sure I had a legendary prison name. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not getting out of this bitch. At least, at least I'm going to be a G in here and I'm going to make a name for myself, you know? Yeah. Um, so I started doing that. And, you know, 23 years old, I started running pretty much every yard I touch and um, four and five yards. You know, like I I had a, uh, I did 12 years straight. And I, only, I did a few years on three yards, mostly always either on four or five yards. You know, uh, definitely never touched a two yard. So I was, actually, <laughs> I, was actually, I was actually in the shoe program. So you can't so. go to the two yard there. So for those who don't who don't know, when he says he did twelve years straight, you maxed out your prison sentence. Yep. So that yeah, means so technically you should do like nine years and nine months on a twelve year day right. in Arizona. Yeah, but I did like eleven years and ten months. Just some credit they did predator packets on me and I was in my last ten months I was in the hole for you know, uh fighting another attempt to murder case. I ended up getting out on that and the dude lived. Man, you know, I wanna go back because you know, you said you were 14 years old, you had all, you know, this this big trajectory in life, in sports, and you just, like you said, you had nothing, nothing was out of place in your childhood, and you was with your mom, and your mom was a good mom. How did she feel when all of this was going on? How was that, how was your home life during this time? The worst, bro, and like, I still feel so bad, my mom's, my mom's the sweetest lady on earth, bro, and like, I just completely manipulated that situation, I took advantage of her, and like, she didn't know what to say because I was, a, you know, I was a. Here's it was the deal. night and day. Was I, yeah, here's the deal. Was I wrong? Yes. And did I have every reason in the world to be bitter as shit? Of course I did. But like, that's all I did was made excuses. And like, my mom was just like, there was no reason with me because I was like, oh, if this would have happened to you, you'd be doing the same shit as me. You know, so like, there was no reason with her. So now it's like, and she, dude, she's a rider, man. Like, for 12 years straight, would come up and visit me every weekend. Like, every other week, she's on the phone with the warden because they got me back in the, back in the hole again and just fighting with them. And she's like, so today, shout out to my mom. It's her shout birthday. Shout out today. to Ma. Happy, hey, happy birthday, Mom. I'm just taking her shopping and she's still got for breakfast. So now is the cool stuff where I just get to treat my mom, though. And like, she always got a place to live with me rent free. And, you know, I'm a, a straight mama's boy. So, like, that's the coolest shit is because besides just making out of prison and doing a 12 years and stuff like that, it's like being able to like change your life and actually like being a good son to my mom. You know, and, like, literally for the first time in my life, I felt like my mom's actually proud of me, which is like mm. what actually means shit to me now. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. Before, all I did was try to impress some people that didn't even give two shits about me. Facts. So let's talk about that then. You said changed, you're a changed man, but obviously you maxed out your sentence while in prison. So when did this change come about? A lot of guys that max out their prison sentence, it seems like you don't want to change and you'll be right back. So what was going on yeah, while you're in prison? I'm not joking. There's just a light switch the day I got out, bro. Like I and that's all I had told myself is like, dude, you, you just gotta make it out here, I'll figure it out. You know what I mean? And like I didn't know, I didn't, and that's what I always talk about this, like, I didn't have a plan when I got out, like, I had zero clue what I was going to do, job-wise, school-wise, living, you know, like, I, I didn't even have a clue, what I shot for, and, like, the top of my, like, the peak of success, if I could figure it all out, was, like, I'd probably be doing construction, making, like, close to minimum wage, like, 15 bucks an hour, mm -hmm. living some, hopefully, some sober life that's boring as hell, but at least I'm not in prison anymore, you know, like, that's what, like, I thought if I reached success, like that's what my life entailed. And it's like, dude, I've, I've been sober seven and a half years now. And it's Congratulations. like, dude, I have, thank you. And I had the greatest life on earth. Bro. And it's like, bro, like my life is literally a fairy tale now. Bro. Like, and I'm not joking. I have the problem now where I cry a lot of times because I'm so happy. You know what I mean? Like I'll be <laughs> driving feeling. my car. Just like, yeah. Like, bro, you see, you, I get in my car. And I'm like, sometimes I get in my car. I'm like, I can't believe this is my car. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I can't, seriously. It's just like, but I just had that cost right now. Like we're shopping. I have a baby shark because I got my first baby coming. So we have, we're doing congratulations again. Well. Yeah. Thank you. Super excited for that. Man. So, and it was like shopping. I was like my mom there and she's like trying to buy all this stuff for your baby shark. And she's like, this is your baby shark. You're not buying this shit. I was like, I don't, you're not ever spending money on me. You know what I mean? You put in <laughs> enough work for all that stuff for me. So it's like, 
it's just nice to be able to treat people and just like, dude, as long as you put other people first, God can always bless you on the backside. You know, that's one thing I learned here. Man, facts. So, like you said, you you hit the ground running when you came home. What was the first thing you did when you came home? After 12 years being away, I noticed so many things that she was like, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to eat this, I want to eat that. I want to know, what was the first thing you ate when you got out? What was the first thing? So, what's crazy is, I don't know if you probably experienced this a little bit, but I, like, all I want to do is eat, I had such horrible anxiety bro like i couldn't even eat like my first day out bro like and then we went out to dinner at uh um we went to like some steakhouse and i'm, I'm not even joking bro. like i threw a fit and, like i ended up like crying because like I, bro looking at the menu i couldn't even i didn't even know what to order i was just like how the hell do you choose this whole order like, what Everything. You, order? you know like people don't even realize when you do like 12 years and like you're slammed down like how much you have to like legit completely rewire your entire brain like mm. Grocery stores, like, and I still get this to this day. A lot of times, I'll go in the grocery store, and, like, almost want to throw a fit. I'm like, well, how the hell do I decide between twelve different kinds of green beans? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and you don't realize, bro, until you haven't had a choice and haven't had like variety. You've been told for twelve variety. years what you got to yeah. eat every day with no choice. Yeah, yeah. There's one, for twelve years. There's one tuna. There's one peanut butter. <laughs> the same, the same there's tuna. There's a whole row of tuna. It's like, bro, which one is what? How do I know what's which good? is the best? <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy sure. you say that because when I did when I got out, all I wanted being from San Diego was a carne asada burrito. That's that's all I wanted. I wanted a carne asada burrito. But when I got home and my sister, they came, all my family came, and I'm eating burrito. I took two bites and I was like, I don't even want this. I don't even yeah. I don't even want this right now. I just want to be with my family. I didn't I couldn't eat, you know. So I yeah, definitely know what you mean, bro. Yeah. I or definitely like, know what you mean. You don't you don't realize what you got till it's gone. Like last yeah. week, JC said when he could have one thing in prison, he had a cheeseburger and he cried. Yeah. Right? And Our last guest, he said the only thing he wanted was a cheeseburger. The police said, they said, hey, listen, I'll bring anything you want. He said, man, I just I just want a cheeseburger. Just give me a burger. Yeah. And he cried when he was eating the burger. That's that's, wow. that's real, man. Yeah, for real. Like I, so I had, I was like so shocked. I came out, I came out because, you know, we, I, we went away. I had like Nokia phones with snake on, you know, and like exactly. you know those <laughs> iPhones, flat you yes. don't watch it. I walk in my brother's house, I'm like, I'm not joking. I almost, I remember that when I walked in his house and I saw right when you walk in, there's a big like 60 inch TV, yeah. flat screen TV, right by his pool table. I'm like, I almost fainted. I was like, and I remember saying, I was like, the TVs are this big out here now. I was just like crying. <laughs> I'm like, but you know, you're like, what the hell is going on? This is really how you guys live. And you forget how shitty we live in there. No, but it's all about perspective. You don't realize so it, it kind of helps you out. But you know, another thing, I was lucky I went away so young, you know, because, like, I didn't know how good life was. You know, I didn't know, like, adult life when you actually have your life together and you can, like, go shopping if you want, go, you know, vacation, do whatever you want. Like, I, I it, it worked for me well because I went away so young. I had never had a, a piece of real life, you know, so I didn't even really know what I was missing. So, right. like, you know, it's like the first few years of your prison suck and the last two are the worst. But, like, in the middle of your shit, like, you don't even think about going home. Like, the middle kind of flies by. You're just, like, you know, I was just politics and doing drugs and just, like. So true. Seriously, you know, so the whole middle kind of flies by. You don't think you're getting out, and you just all I'm trying to do is make a name for myself. And and then before you know, you're like, holy shit, but I'm supposed to go home like next year. You know what I mean? I was like, damn, I better figure this shit out. Like, luckily, like I said, my last investigation when I went in the hole for ten months straight, and I got released from solitary confinement, was like, was for an attempted murder. And thank God that happened because you know I was 175 pounds, strung out, like shooting dope on the yard. And Mm. I went to the hole and got sober, and ended up getting out of prison weighing 250 pounds with 10 months sober. Thank God. So let's talk about that. You said you got out a light or switch flipped in your head. You're this yeah. hardened criminal struggling with substance abuse. Obviously, politicking in prison, violence is the language you know. How does that change? Obviously, obviously a switch flipped, but what does the process of change look like for you when you get out? I just told myself, man, like I remember being in prison and like I knew like once I saw how shit worked, I knew I had like so far to go to like wire my brain to like handle situations in there and to like literally switch it on to like to be a politic guy. You know what I'm saying? Cause I'm not fr- from that shit. I was never a gangbang or anything like that. And, like I just knew like as much as I transform myself in there, I could do the shit out here and it'd be twice as easy, you know? So like, I just, I just really realized like right then I was like, all I told myself was I just got to get out. Once I get out, I'll figure it out. You know what I'm saying? And then like the second I got out, I was like, and what's crazy is I'll give you another example. I always tried to overcompensate in prison because like, I had long blonde hair and I was from Ahwatukee, you know, and it's like, it's like a nice suburb area, you know? So like, I always had to overcompensate to try and fit in with the game, you know? And I remember I'm like a year to the game. This is right before this incident happens that I went to the hole for. And I don't remember what it is. The cop like wouldn't pop the door for me or something like that. And like, I kind of like flipped out on him. You know? I was like, fucking just wait till tomorrow. You know what I mean? Blah, blah, blah. You know? Cause when you're running the yard on those yards, like them cops, 
they kind of do pretty much what the shot caller says for the most part, you know, right. they just want to go home safe and all that's not, you know, so I kind of flare up on the school, you know? And, um, and then I go back to my, to my bunk afterwards and my homie, who's like triple OG in there, you know? And he's like, he tells me like, chap, I'm worried about you. And I was just like, I was like, why are you worried about me? He's like, bro, he's like, you're angry. And I was just like, yeah, duh. You know? And he's like, he's like, for real, he's like, you got to let that go before you get out. And instead of like thinking like, holy shit, I should probably try and like worry about my thinking before I get out. I took it as like, I finally made it in here. Like literally that was what my mindset was. I was like, I was like, all right, cool. I'm literally one of them. They know I'm crazy now. They know I'm a hothead, you know, this and all that. And I like took it for the exact opposite, opposite mm -hmm. ends of it. And, but then I realized like right then I was like worried because when I got out, I was like so bitter and angry at the world. And I can't tell you like the day I got out, I went from just like being the most angry, bitter human being on the face of the earth to just like, I felt like it, it, it like it went away that I did 12 years in prison and like how angry I was and bitter about that. Like, I just felt like the luckiest guy in the world. And I felt like I had been given a second chance of life that I didn't deserve. And I never thought I was going to have it. So I went from like feeling like ungrateful to like being the most grateful human being on the face of the earth. And I was just like, Holy shit. I have another chance. I got to really figure this shit out. And then like, you realize like there's, you can ask people questions here. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have to figure shit out on your own. Like I've been, I figured shit out on my own for prison for 12 years straight. And, like out here, like, I didn't know how to do anything when I got out, but like I got a phone and you can call people and ask them to do shit. You know, and, like you can like ask Google, like you how got YouTube, you like <laughs> YouTube, like literally you can learn anything in the world you want out here. You know what I'm saying? And, it's like, and once you realize that and apply yourself, like you realize that like, you can no joke, like do anything you want in the world out here as long as you put your mind to it. Yeah. There's no excuses. I guess one of my questions I have just hearing based on what you're saying is because you didn't grow up in gang culture. Were you, because you had to overcompensate to make a name for yourself. Were you putting up a front the whole time to make this name for yourself? But that was never really you. You were never an angry for sure. I was gang up, member. Yeah I was, yeah, I was putting up a front, but here's the deal. I was putting up a front, but I was also tough, too. So it just, it just yeah. worked out good. And I was like, it was the biggest, fakest image you have. I was like, I'm this yo, mean killer, blah, blah, blah. But here's the deal. If someone did try to test me, I'd whoop their asses. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so it kind of worked. But yeah, it was all fake, bro. But like, you know maybe that's why not. your adjustment on the outside was like, okay, I was never really this crazy killer shot caller. I can go back to being the guy I originally was when I growing up. And that's my mindset is like, if I wasn't this guy and that was, and to swing into that spectrum was so much harder than it is to just like going back to being the normal person, which I really am. It's easy. If you just tell yourself that, you know what I mean? Like it's all about perspective. You just have to like break shit down and like, look at the scenario from like a, from like a bird's eye view, you know what I'm saying? And not just get wrapped up in the emotions and the, and the certain time of it, you know? Definitely. It's one thing that um, you said that just, that stuck out to me. And you said when you came home, it's like a light switch and you just, you know, you were grateful and all those years just released from you. And I, I feel the same way, bro. Cause like you say, you, you left when you was 18. I left when I was 17 years old and when yeah. I came home and they always see me smile, yeah, you know, guy, he's never <laughs> not happy. I'm always, Dude, my prison idea had a smile on there, bro. Man, I'm, man, I'm <laughs> always smiling, bro. I'm always smiling because I know where I was at. You know, I know bad. I know terrible. I've seen people die and people just walk past them and all that stuff. So it's like now it's like, why not smile? This is my second chance. You know, like you said, this is my sex second chance. Will <laughs> You know, like this is my second chance. But now it's hard to turn the smile off. It's hard sometimes. You know, my face be hurting the back of my head. <laughs> <laughs> he smiled for a long time. They had my, they had my ID on the window right there. It's a big ass smile. And like, I used to be like such a dumbass. Bro. Like, they would say something to me on my ID. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, you guys can't face me with this shit. Like, this shit is nothing to me. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, you can, and I used to literally say that. Like, you can have another 10 years of my sense and I'll be fine. You know what I'm saying? I'll still have a smile on my face. So I got a question. So you came home and it sounded like everything was good. But was there any struggles, you know, coming home immediately like we'll talk about any struggles that you faced yeah so here and here's the biggest thing so when i got out i was like i knew i was a drug addict and stuff but like i i didn't really resonate or agree with the with the thing that i was an alcoholic right because like i had never drank by myself i never like i didn't have alcohol at the house like i was a kid remember? you know like, even when i got out the only thing i did i drank at and partied at bars and stuff you know like i was never a closet social drink like that. So, like, yeah so i was like i was like I don't really think I'm an alcoholic, you know? And like, of course, when you go get away at 18 years old and you get out when you're 30 years old, you want to have the whole bar scene too. So I was like, I'm not an alcoholic. I need to go drink and figure this shit out, you know? So of course I wanted to go party and sell that life. <laughs> the problem with me is like, I could be fine drinking six times in a row and then the seventh time I might get blacked out and if there's drugs, I might do drugs. So that's the problem with me. And then that's what happened about, um, I think nine months after I got out. I, um, dude, we were drinking at the bar. It was a buddy's birthday. I remember it was a Friday afternoon. It was still light out. I remember it's like it was yesterday. The last thing I remember was doing is a shot of Rumplemints. And 
Next thing I know, I wake up in an ambulance. Wow. And I'm like, I remember I came to and I was like, look at the paramedic to my right. And I'm like all strapped up on this bed. And I was like, what the fuck happened to me? And I'm like, literally, I'm thinking, I'm like, fuck, I must have gotten a fight at the bar or something. But I'm like, hold on. The other guy should be in the ambulance if I got in a fight. <laughs> and I'm like, my, I'm like, my hands aren't fucked up. My face is fucked up. So I have no idea what's going on. So I'm like, I turn to the paramedic and I'm like, yo, what am I doing in here? And he's like, you overdose. I was like, overdose? I was like, I don't even use drugs anymore. And he's like, well, you did today. And I'm like, you're f-. and I'm like, I literally remember thinking, you're fucking kidding me. Like, what an idiot I am. You know what I'm saying? And then I'm like, on top of that, I'm thinking, how did I even use drugs? I can't, I, I have zero recollection of anything. And I'm like, literally barely coming in out of consciousness. And then I go from the victim mindset to being like, why did I survive? Why couldn't I have just die? Like, I'm done suffering and fighting. Like, you know what I mean? Like, literally, my life sucks. Like, the fact that I made it out of prison and I'm still dealing with this shit, like, I'm just over. Like, literally, bro, I was over. I was done with it all. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, I was literally mad that I survived that. I was like thinking, like, why the fuck couldn't I have just died and been done with this stuff? You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, my ego, I'll never commit suicide. But I'm like, if I die doing that, it is what it is. You know right. what I'm saying? It was an accident. I didn't mean to. I didn't commit suicide and do the little pussy cop out thing. So I was like mad that I survived. And then, like, next thing I know, I hear my brother in the hallway and he's on the phone with my dad, of course. And I'm like, so now I'm like this big 30 year old prison shock caller. I'm like, I'm still scared that like my little brother's calling my dad on me. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm like, I hear him in the hallway. I'm like, I remember yelling, like, Matt, why the fuck you calling dad and he's like do you even know what happened i was like dude i have no idea what happened they told me i overdosed and he's like yeah so i guess they found me i was completely dead no heartbeat or nothing wow. they gave me like seven shots of narcan and i'm getting my heartbeat back to beat and by the time they got me to the hospital my heart was only beating six beats a minute wow. the doctor said i'm the only person to survive in this condition that he's seen and i was like Oh my God. You know what I mean? And then, so of course it's a victim mentality. You're laying in the bed and like, bro, it was just like then it was like clearly that God think it's the only way that I can explain what happened to me. But I went from like feeling like, damn, I wish I, I wish I would have died. And then I have survivor's remorse because like, how did I survive this? And I have so many friends that aren't here anymore. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm for sure a bigger fuck up than them. So why would God spare my life and not these other people's? And then I'm like, on top of that, like, I still haven't even worked a day in my life. I have no, like the, the hurdles ahead of me are like, they seem insurmountable at this point. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, why even try? Right. And then like a light goes off to me, which is clearly a God thing. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to figure this shit out. You know, like I'm done making excuses. And like, it literally just came over me like that. Just while I was like laying in bed, I was like, all right, I'm going to fucking do this shit. You know, like I'm going to quit making excuses. I'm going to actually go get a job. Cause all the place I said, I was trying to get a job, but they won't hire a phone. I didn't really try to get a job. You know what I'm saying? I just said, they're not going to hire a phone. So I was like, all right, I'm actually like, Stop making excuses and actually do the shit that I say that I was doing the whole time. And I go to sell cars, man. And dude, it's it's so crazy how like when you switch your mindset, like stuff can just change at an instant. You know, like I went from that and then I go to sell cars. I made nine thousand dollars my first month ever working, ten grand my second month there. What? I made a hundred and nine grand my first year out of prison, two hundred grand my second year out of prison. I was making over three hundred grand a year for the past two years. And then it was like I went to prison for, I stole a Mercedes Benz from the Mercedes Benz of Chandler dealership, brand new. And now I'm like a finance manager at this big dealership in Scott. So I'm like one of three people that have a key to the safe. I'm one of three people that can actually count cash. That's over $10,000. Uh. And it's like my whole life changed, like literally like that over in two seconds, just because I started putting the work in to stop making excuses. And then it's like, and I still talk to a bunch of people that are in recovery, you know, but I worked every weekend, you know, so I didn't do anything. And then like one day it came over to me. I was just like, man, I got to get out of here, man. Like, could do what I did getting out of prison. You know what I'm saying? And like the fact that I did that and not to, I'm not trying to brag, like God did that for me. You know what I'm saying? God blessed me so I could go back and show other people that we can do this, you know, like, so I'm not trying to take credit for this, but like what I did, I didn't think was possible. And I didn't even think like it was a, I literally didn't even think it was an option, you know? So like, I, and I remember thinking, I'm like, man, I got to quit my job and just go try and tell these inmates that we can do this shit. You know what I mean? Cause like the inmates don't know we can do this. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you got some guy in there telling you when you were still doing your 16 years of prison sense that like you can get out and make six figures and do all this and that, you'd probably be fired up right now. But, but you'd be thinking, how the hell is that going to happen, right? Exactly. How much dope we got to sell? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm most, like, this, it's most, not like I, I can show you. And now I can show you what I did and I can yeah. lay it out for you. I can show you the exact same thing. It's like, right. you can't even, you can't even argue because it's like, it's literally really happening now. So now I'm like, all right, I got to get in here and teach these dudes in prison. So like, and then uh, I think. Look how far I made it in seven and a half years I've been out. Like, imagine if I would have been, like, doing productive shit for even a few time. years in prison. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, so now, like, that's what the next part of me is, like, I'm almost done with this prison curriculum that I'm going to try to sell to the states and governments so on teaching inmates how to be successful before they can get out. So now, like, my podcast is in 290 prisons right now across the whole country. Mm. Um, every county jail in Arizona, they can watch my podcast. 
And I literally just want to help people. So instead of my biggest goal in life right now, on top of just helping people get sober, is like for you, when you're getting out of prison after doing 16 years, you were probably, and I'm just guessing this, for one, clearly happy as hell to get out, but two, like scared as hell to get out. And three, like, holy shit, what's going to go on when I get out here? Mm -hmm. Part of you is like, I don't even know what this real world is like, but I'm excited to figure it out. But then like on top of that, you're like, I don't even know what I'm going to do for a career or anything, but like, I just want to go try this world out right now. Like instead of being all scared and apprehensive and like nervous to tackle the world, like I want inmates to get out and be like, fucking, I got three more days so I can get out and go start making money now. You know what I'm saying? I got three more days so I can go get out and make six figures. You know what I'm saying? It's like we can make six figures and us inmates that, that have done prison time and have had our backs against the wall. Like we have an advantage on the rest of the world. Once we can harness that and like know that like, when you've been where we came from, bro, there's nothing worse they can do to affect you. You know what I'm right. saying? Like the worst that can happen already happened to us. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So it's like we're playing with house money out here now. You know what I'm saying? So it's like when you can really look at it like you're literally playing with house money, you can't lose. It gives you confidence to tackle anything in the world that you want. And if you have confidence, then you can do anything. Mm. Now, that's real stuff, man. And, you know, it's crazy that you say that because I everything you just said, that's exactly what I was experiencing, you know, Damn. when I came home. And I wanted to – I just – in my mind, when I came home, I was like, okay, I know I'm going to work two or three jobs so I can stay out the way and just stack some money until I figure out what it is that I want to do. You know, I just, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just know I just need to work. Until I figured out. Yes. And, it's, and it's funny because before your guys' mindset came along, the common post-prison mindset was I got to do construction. They take felons. Mm-hmm. I got to pick up a trade, go to trade school. Yep. You know, the best I'll ever do is be part of a union electrician construction. Maybe one day I can be a contractor. But that was like... The, the highest bar you can get outside of prison. And now you obviously want to show them there's much more ahead than that. It's 2023, bro. Like you could go, I was a finance manager. I got a neck tattoo. I'm slowing down head to toe in prison tabs. You know what I'm saying? Like if you can, if you got a mouthpiece and you can talk, you can do sales. Like no matter what your record is, you know, hire you to go do sales nowadays. And like the <laughs> tattoos, a lot of, there's a lot of dorks that never touch a prison yard that are covered head to toe in prison tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, most definitely. So all your excuses are gone because if you can't even say the tattoos thing will hard to stop you from getting a job now because it doesn't matter nowadays, bro. It's twenty twenty three. If you're not if you're not making the money you want to do what you want, it's solely because you're you're a handicap in yourself and you're not putting in the work. Yeah, most definitely. That's that's very true. There's no there is no excuse to why you can't succeed. You know, like we're our biggest enemy a lot of times. You know, we're our biggest enemies because we we that self doubt. All that self doubt. Oh, I can't do it. I can't do this. I can't do that. But you can, and you're showing it, and you're showing it to thousands and thousands of individuals that you can come home and make a lot of money legitimately and never have to look back. So, real quick, what were the first steps for you getting into prisons and helping out prisoners, and what evolved into this podcast? What were your first steps getting back in? When I so I was on I don't know if you guys know the Vice. Have you seen that uh, show? I was a teenage felon on Vice TV. Mm-mm. No, I haven't. So yeah, it um, it's on Hulu right now. You can watch it. So I was on Vice. Vice they did a whole TV show about me. It's season two, episode five. Was my oh, whole wow. story. It's called the it's called the shot caller episode. And I just once that went out, I, I started just getting like dude random DMs and emails from all over the country once the Vice show aired, you know. And then like I was being asked to speak here, and then I was just like. And then the what's crazy is one of my dudes from the prison yard works now like in recovery for them. And then he was telling the director of parole about my story now. And they like what's crazy is like even in the at first all the uh, parole officers and COs and you know wardens and stuff they knew Chappie for nothing good. So like when my boy was like you should see what Chappie's doing here. The wardens like this is no way that's Chappie's doing positive shit out here. You know what I mean? And it's like, so, so once they saw that, then they started having me speak to inmates, you know? And then it's like, and then someone else connects me. She's like, I really would love to have your podcast in our prison. So then I sent there and then they put my podcast in there and then they want me to speak there. So it's just like, well, it's just like I said, just getting out there and just getting your name out there and p- people can see if you're trying to help people. And like, I've been doing that for the past year and a half. And I walked away from 350,000 on your job just trying to help people. I had no idea what I was going to do. When I quit my job, I had zero plans. I was going to do a podcast. Mm. What I just did saved you, a bunch of money. I like, I'm gonna figure it out. Oh, so you didn't even have no plan of doing. You just know I want to do. Was the dream to help people, or just like I'm gonna figure something out? My whole dream, no, my whole dream was to help people. And I was like, I, bro, I, I literally just watched these dudes making money on Instagram for long enough, and I was just like, there's no way in hell these dorks on Instagram are making money like this, and I'm not gonna figure this shit Come out. So I like literally <laughs> just saved up a bunch of money. I was like, I'm gonna go help you. And I'm gonna figure this shit out all on my own. And I like, like 
just paid my own bills out of my savings account for the past year and a half. I got just 20 different things going on, you know, and then launched the podcast. I got my book coming out next week. Um, dude, I got, I got so much stuff going on and I do credit card processing deals. I've, I'm at about seven different businesses now all launched in the past years. I had no idea what I was going to do two years ago. Mm. That's amazing, bro. And like you said, like there's so many people still looking to tour you. Do you, are you still connected with people in there? Because you, 12 years, you probably yeah. had, you know, built a lot of connections. So do you still talk to some dude, of the, uh, it's fellas funny. in there? Yeah it's, yeah, it's funny. So I, I do, I email a few of them and it's, crazy and like they'll i'll get a random email from one of my dude i got a, my buddy that's slammed down and super max and validated aryan brotherhood member and he's uh he messaged me uh or emailed me like a few months ago you know and it's so crazy now like what's going on there so like he had a cop a co went over to his door in super max and was like dude have you heard what your boy chappie's doing right there and he had no idea that i was on that my podcast on the tablet and he literally had a cop show him that it was on there so it's like, it's so crazy what's going on. Like, there's literally cops over there walking around Supermax right now being like putting inmates on my podcast. You know what I'm saying? Because like, I was the biggest fuck up in prison too. You know what I'm saying? Like 20 dirty UAs and the whole every other month. You know what I'm saying? So like, and I did nothing but politic and shoot drugs for 12 years. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? If I can do that for 12 years, straight, so just literally shut it off like a light switch when I get out. There's no reason anybody else can. Mm. So let me ask you this. Do you feel some, because one of our guests that we talked to, they felt some type of regret because they're out and the people that you know they was in prison with are not have you ever felt that not i felt the opposite bro because here's the deal like i i did my time and some bro i did 12 years for a burglary charge here's the deal there's a lot of people that kill people that are in prison and should get out but aren't ever getting out but i mean it shit is it brother i mean here if i if i killed somebody bro like you, you just can't say shit you know what i'm saying like it is what it is but i did 12 years for a burger truck no i deserve to be out a lot lot, 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 lot. Years, you know what I'm that's saying? ridiculous yeah. i'm not bro that's ridiculous 12 years for a burglary charge at 18 years yeah. old. at 18 years old at yep. 18 years old come on now that's a that's a bigger story in and of itself you know, yeah, so like it, yeah. I, I can see what you're talking about. Like I had survivors remorse from like surviving yeah. over the overdose stuff, but like I never yeah. had that about prison. Like I shouldn't have got out, and these guys were still sitting there because nah. I mean, I did I did my time. You did your that. time. Yeah, I've never felt that. I've never felt that either. But I was just curious because he said, "I'm like, man, I wonder if anybody else feels it." Because I'm like, man, I did yeah. my time. I man, let me go. Yeah, you know sure, sure. I love y'all. You know, call me, it's good. I'll but I gotta go. Yo, when are you guys coming to grab me from here? <laughs> <laughs> Now, All right, the experiment's done. Am I going home yet? <laughs> so you have your podcast, you said, in 290 prisons. Do you have prisoners reaching out to you like, thanks for the hope, thanks for your help? Every day. I'm Every definitely going to be better on the outside because of you. Every day. I mean, I can show you guys this after getting Like, people are like, I, your podcast changed my life. Like, I listen to every single podcast in there. And, like, I got enrolled. In, the one I just got yesterday was like, I've listened to every single one of your podcasts. The second I started listening to your podcast, I enrolled myself in school. I got my GED. And it's like, so that's why I know. Like, the podcast, when you you can really make a difference, bro. Cause, because... You, you know this, a lot of inmates, they ain't going to listen to nobody unless they feel like you've walked your, their footsteps you know, or walked in their shoes. You know what I'm saying? And like, Facts. I don't know how it is where you did time, but out here in Arizona, like, if I'm on a three yard and I've been to a four yard or a five yard and you're trying to tell me something, but you ain't even been to a four yard or five yard, I ain't listening to shit you said. You can't tell me so there's nothing that people can tell me they can't, that they, but so that's why it works for so well of me. I've been everywhere you said and something, I ran it all. Like, right. there's nothing you can tell me. And I know I'm telling you, like, that don't mean shit. It's not cool mm -hmm. out here. What's cool is like turning that shit off in your mindset and actually just being a, like a normal citizen out here, you know? So like, that's what, that's what I promise myself on is just shutting all that shit off, man. Just literally being just a normal productive member of society, bro. Now, I love that you're saying that because that's like when I, when the fellas that I was in prison with reach out to me and like, man, like you are, like you give us hope. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. because I did all my time on a level four. I paroled as a level four and in California, that's the highest level, yep. a level four. So I paroled as a level four. And so they know, you know what I'm saying? Like they know my how I was in there. And so they know that I'm sincere in who I am today. Like this isn't an yeah. act. This isn't, you know, that's, it's none of that. This is so sincere. And my hope is to bring them along this path. Like you can do something different, bro. You don't have to do that. You don't have to have that mentality. You don't have to be stuck. You're so much more than that, you know? Yep. And it's up to us to show them that. Right. Every That's single day, you guys this platform just the same way he gave me this platform. Man, every day, like everything happens for a reason. Like meeting Steven, you know, just coming to the gym, Chula Vista. By the way, TG Chula Vista, check us out. You know, so it's a credible gym. You know, yep. that's where you you know sponsor and you see it. You know, but definitely I, everything happens for a reason, man. Every single thing. Now it sounds like you're a man of faith. 
Um, how did that come about? And what is that? What type of role does that play in your life? You've mentioned God numerous times throughout this interview. Where so is that yeah. coming come in, ah, come into play? What's crazy, I didn't even believe in God up until about a year and a half ago. And I, so I had just walked away from my job. You know, I walked away from a big career and I'm my own office making 350. Mm. And uh, like literally, bro, four years out of prison. Like it was, uh, you couldn't even, and no one in my family has money. Like no one on either side of my family. So like I didn't come from money. Like I, I instantly got out of prison was more successful than people on both sides of my family. And um, I still, like I told you, I, I walked away from my job and I didn't even know what I was going to do. So I just tried to like go in and have lunches and coffees with all these people that I knew and just trying to turn something into something, you know? And I'm out with having lunch with Sheriff Lamb. I don't know if you know the American Sheriff. He had a few different TV shows on Haney and Live PD and One and all that stuff. And he's a good friend of mine. And he like asked me, he's like, bro, he's like, why don't you make some prison curriculum and come here and teach these inmates what you did so they can be successful and make it out? You know, and I was just like, bro, I'd love to. And he's like, tell me that they have like budgets for reentry curriculum. I didn't even know anything about that. And I was like, no way. Weird. That'd be dope as hell. I would love. Imagine like making money like I was making before, but actually helping people, you know, exactly. like inmates, which is it's the coolest shit ever. And then I literally get home from from having the lunch with him. And I swear to God, I get a DM from this guy. And he's like, yo, hey, I'm the biggest prison curriculum developer in the country. You seem pretty connected, but I'd love to help you out any way I can. I was like, how does two things like that happen back to back, you know? And I'm like, and I'm a guy that never catches breaks, you know what I'm saying? I still have that mindset. Like I'm ripped off from life. God doesn't like me. Like I don't catch breaks. I still have that mindset. So I'm like, I'm like thinking this dude hits me up. I'm like, that's so random that these three things both happen the same day. And I haven't even thought about this one bit, you know? And like my next thing goes over, I was like, holy shit, maybe this is God showing me that like God's actually real. And then I'm like, so I'm telling you just to get down and pray. And I'm like, mm-hmm. jump out of my bed at like 10 30 at night. Grounds is already laying this sleeping. And I just like jump off my bed and I pray. And I didn't remember how to pray. I was just like, I don't know what this is, but if this is you, like, thank you, like, whatever, you know? And I'm just like, the next day I get up and I'm just like, holy shit, man, God is real. And this is literally what he's doing to show me. And I can't even tell you, like, ever since then, like, when I had faith, it just, like, it makes everything in my life make sense. So, like, I went from feeling, like, shitty, like, I was ripped off to getting the 12 years to being grateful that I got 12 years. You know, like, I'm not joking. And it sounds Facts. cliche to say, but I wouldn't change anything. Like, bro, like, yeah, if can. I had to do over, people always ask me, like, what would you do if you could only got, like, three or four years, like, on that burger truck that you would have got? I was like, nothing, bro, because I wouldn't make what I'm doing now anything. You know what I'm saying? I'd probably just... I would probably be working in the car dealership, making that money and not even knowing like how much more cool shit I could do in the world because I don't, I didn't have that perspective on life, you know? like, so I wouldn't change anything. Like, I'm grateful that I got 12 years and like God put me in that shitty ass situation because I can help other people that aren't even in, in that bad of a situation. I can give them perspective that the situation doesn't suck as bad. Mm. That's good. One other thing we had a guest last week who, uh, he just said he was a complete wild untamed animal when he got out and his relationship with his wife has been, a struggle because of all his past things in prison. It sounds like you have a, you said a wife now and you got a kid on the way. How's your relational life going? Thank God that I used the first two as practice, practice rounds. I got to figure it out now. You know what I'm <laughs> like, I, I had no idea. And like the first one, like I was like, I still feel bad. My first one was like, she wasn't a victim, but I was a straight prison shot call. You know what I'm saying? Like, so like I had, and I'm, and I mean, here's the deal. I don't, I never want to come off like, I don't even know what the right glorifying. word is. I'm, I'm just, yeah, glorifying anything that I did, but I'm, I'm just real, bro. And I just, just try to show real. the full transformation. Facts. You know what I'm saying? So, like, the, my first person I was with, I, I had the mindset, like, I run this shit. You're lucky to be with me. Like, I'm with you. And, like, just be grateful about that. Like, treated her like one of my prison youngsters, you know? And and then the next one I got with, I was, like, actually, and I wasn't faithful. And, like, the next one I got with, I was, like, I was like, all right, I'm going to actually be faithful to this one and try and do this right, you know? And then, like, I was faithful to that one and then like realized I was like, all right. So it's like, I didn't take double stepping stones. So like, thank God that I was with those two before I met the one I'm with now, because she would have never put up with half that shit. But like, I, t- <laughs> I t- like, those other relationships like showed me how to treat a woman now, because if not, I would have never been with her right now. You know what I'm saying? So like now I, I, I learned through trial and error how to treat a woman and like, yes, yeah, super happy with my uh, relationship now. And But that's like I said, I had to learn through trial and error just like anything like, you know? Mm. So what's next for what? Yeah, yeah, what's, what's next? next? Shout what's... out to my book. My book, Against All Odds, will be out next week. Um, you can get it on Amazon. It'll be on everything too. And like, I put a lot of I put a lot into this book. And um, to be honest, dude, I just I think this book can really change the world. And okay. I here's the deal: helping people that aren't in prison will make me a lot more money with what I do. But I, my passion is the prison people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, so like, 
no joke, bro. I want to single handedly like tackle this recidivism rate. And I want to like help and inspire inmates from all across the country to like literally read my book, listen to my podcast, do my prison curriculum. And you literally will get out of prison instead of like being scared to take on the world. Like you'll be ready to attack the world, like make something of yourself, you know, like the world's you get second chances nowadays. You know what I'm saying? And like, why not make the most of them? You know what I'm saying? Like there's nothing in the world. Like once you go to prison, it doesn't matter if you, killed somebody if they sentence you to 20 years in prison you paid your debt to society once you get done with that 20 years so you deserve a second chance facts definitely <laughs> i agree with you 100 it's not always that way yeah but then you just go left you know say hey make another way you know because yeah. you, you can always make something happen man you can always make something happen and if anything you are a great example you say you are yeah. the great example and so i, I i'm just I'm just so appreciative of everything that you've done and, you know, the person that you are and everything that you're doing for people who are formerly incarcerated or currently incarcerated. You know, my passion is people who are formerly incarcerated. My passion is kids, you know, before they get to the system, you know, like that's that's really where my heart is at. Like, I don't want you to get there. You know, what can yeah. I do to keep you from becoming just another statistic? Absolutely. Yeah, when I go I go speak in high school, so it's like, and you got two tailored speeches. You know, when I'm speaking to kids, I'm like, yo, what can you do to not go to where I, what, to where I went to? And then when you're talking to dudes that were in prison, it's like, yo, how did you turn that shit off and just be a productive guy now? You know, and it's like, but yeah, that's uh, my biggest passion right there is the kids, of course. Dude, like, I, I talk to some um, kids in like the youth direction, uh, one direction program, which is like Sheriff Lamb's thing, and like 11, 12, 13 year old kids. Well, that's, that's, that's where the, like the bread and butter is man like there's nothing cooler than when you can actually get a kid to like buy it and change his life you know what i'm saying it's really tough when you get some hard-headed youngsters you know but that's my it, the biggest passion when you get them kids to turn that light on so they can man. avoid like years and years of trouble like i like i had to endure Thanks. so peter how can we reach you if someone needs to reach out to you someone needs to talk to you someone's got a question what are our ways we can reach out Instagram is my biggest. My Instagram name is Peter underscore Meyerhoff, M-E-Y-E-R-H-O-F-F. -F. Uh, my website is PeterMeyerhoff.com. That'll have my new book release. I got my apparel brand on there, all my podcasts. I'm on everything, every other platform, too. Roll Call with Chappie podcast, Apple, Spotify, on YouTube, uh, TikTok. the same thing. Roll Call with Chappie. I'm all over. And, like, I run my own Instagram. I handle all my business emails. So if you write me an email or a DM, you will get a response from me myself. Just like we did. You know, yep. he's not, hey, not, you guys, he's not lying. <laughs> he's not <laughs> lying, man. People don't think they'll, they'll send me some DMs like that, and then they're like, is this really you? And I was like, yes, I told you. Yeah, 100% this is me. And this is what I do, bro. And, hey, Peter, man, we appreciate you. And I and I don't mean this, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, man. We definitely appreciate everything you're doing and the fact that you came on and bless us with your presence, man. We definitely appreciate you. Likewise, man. I appreciate you guys. That's why I did it. And I love in this post prison space, the formerly incarcerated spaces. Everyone has the same goal, the same heart, the same ideas. We just want to help. We want to give back. There's no real expectation. Like you said, you started just to help. We'll start just to help. We start just to help. And the whole goal is ending recidivism, stopping the kids from going. And we're all a team on this. And so that's why I think it makes it even more special is everyone we interview feels the exact same way as you do. Maybe not doing it as big as you, but they all have the same idea and the same heart for the incarcerated. It's all that matters. Yeah. It's all that matters. Yes, sir, man. So it's another great episode. I'm Will. And I'm Steven. And this, this is, is the, the Post P Chronicles. Chronicles.